Not yet. Okay. I'm okay? Okay, great. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Planning and Heritage Committee meeting. And uh, I'll call the meeting to order, and do we have any declarations of conflicts today? Yes. Councillor Buck? No, those are um, those discussion items are open. Yep. You're in conflict for something? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> just in follow up to our, uh, I, th I don't know whether I am or I'm not. Um, so I haven't received uh, official clarification uh, with regards to the short term rental uh, rollout. Okay. So I think it would be prudent uh, in the interim that until I get that clarification that I not be part of that discussion so okay. it's kind of a gray matter don't really know for sure so what what's that you should say what it is. oh say what it is yeah. oh, okay all right uh what's that yeah so it's a family member who's involved in the uh, short-term rental business so um it would be uh i don't know whether i am or i'm not so until i get that clarification i think it might be best to step aside okay madam chair yes. um I think that came up in uh, the debate back in February of this year with one of the councillors. Did we get a legal opinion on that? Because um, I believe there was a family, there is a family member of the councillor in question that has Airbnbs, but that's no profit to him or his his family. It's it's and 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 I believe that they were then able to proceed with. Um the SDR stuff because they were found not to be in conflict or were they found to be in I conflict? I have asked, the, Madam Chair, I've asked the city solicitor but I haven't heard back from her on this particular case um, and I will, uh, I'm sure she'll be back to me later in the day or in yeah, the morning. No, the reason I bring it up, Donna, it, it was one of the councillors yeah. during that debate and when we discussed the, the bylaw that's currently in place, he declared conflict of interest because of a family member owning and operating. No, but I'd like to get a clarification on that too. Thank you. Okay. So, so for today, sure. remove myself for today, and then we'll wait upon clarification to see whether I rejoin the conversation or whatever that might be. All right. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Peck. Uh, can I get an approval of the agenda? Moved by His Worship, seconded by Councillor McCabe, and an adoption of the minutes from January the 3rd. Again, moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by His Worship. Any business arising from the minutes? Oh, <laughs> okay. The only thing I had wanted to bring up was I'm wondering if we got any more follow up on the um, old Irwin printing um, building. I know that we did find out for sure it was not <coughs> it was not a heritage building, but was there any more? Um, I know I forwarded the information to our bylaw enforcement officer, but was there anything, was there any more action items in our, from this department? Madam Chair, I thought it was, uh, it, it was going to head in their direction to see if the building uh, you know, uh, met the criteria for you know, either a dangerous or unsightly building, and uh, at this stage, there, you know, we typically wouldn't engage in that kind of uh, discussion. So, uh, I didn't do any other follow up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we can move on to the. Uh, I had something. Oh, go ahead, Manager. I, I was just looking through in the minutes there under uh, page three, uh, under the Irwin printing property. Uh, the last bullet says property could. And then there's nothing after that. Um, I don't know what that. <laughs> I don't know what that line was about. Just crossed out. Okay. There's nothing. There's nothing missing. Okay. Right. Maybe you're going to bring it up in regard to under new business to just to add the other item in regard to the closed session. Yes. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so we can move on to our discussion items and we will start off with the um, 
Mr. Forbes is going to give us some uh, direction around our official plan and the processes and the and subcommittee in terms of reference and um, how we do that public rollout. So over to you, Mr. Forbes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so as the committee is aware, we're working with O2 uh, consultants out of Calgary and they're working with Uplands, which is a local firm out of Halifax. Uh, they're uh, busy this month uh, uh, trying to finalize a, a, like a preliminary draft to take out to the public. So uh, in anticipation when that is ready, uh, I think it would be prudent if we were to establish a subcommittee uh, that would involve the members of this committee. Uh, I'm suggesting three members of the planning board and one member of the heritage board uh, to meet relatively regularly to be updated in regard to uh, what is in that new official plan. It's a pretty dense document. It's over 100 pages. Uh, pretty well every line in it is, you know, has some kind of a, you know, a, either a project or an initiative or a strategy that, uh, you know, it would be ideal if it could be explained uh, before we get uh, uh, head out to the public. Um, I would just put the caveat that this is just preliminary. This this committee would be uh, uh, informing just a subset of these other committees, including council. But just before we go out to the public as well, we would have more intensive meetings with all of council to explain uh, what's in that document. But. Uh, I just think it's very uh, helpful if we have some people, either on the planning board, on the heritage board, uh, or and on council, uh, that uh, have had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to to be informed in regard to why are those provisions in there. there there's a lot of linkages from one section to another as to uh, their thinking and rationale in regard to why they've uh, uh, crafted the document that they way they do. Uh, all of that is to say that once we're up to speed in regard to at least what's in the draft, that doesn't preclude the fact that once you go to the public, uh, things can change. But it's in anticipation of uh, informing uh, a group of people that this uh, special subcommittee in regard to uh, you know the real uh, uh, meat that that is in this document, and uh, you know and hopefully. Uh, uh, you, by the time we get up for public consultation, they'll be uh, you know, up to speed in regard to what the uh, you know the consultants had in mind as uh, uh, you know the various policies, provisions, objectives in the plan, and then we can explain. Uh, staff can can explain to the public. The consultants can, can explain to the public, and uh, as well as uh, you know uh, some of these uh, additional uh, uh, members of planning board and uh, heritage board are aware of those sections that pertain to uh, to their uh, field of expertise. So uh, at this time, we were just uh, 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 hoping to get a, a recommendation or a resolution from council to, to form the committee. Uh, the, uh, we're not ready to uh, have those meetings just right away, but if we at least have the committee uh, uh, in place uh, and, and vet it through council, then we can uh, f uh, finalize the, the terms of reference for that committee when they first meet in regard to what we're going to attempt to achieve uh, with the various meetings, times, dates, in regard to uh, you know w when we can uh, get the, uh, the most amount of people in the room at that time. So at this stage, we're just asking that uh, uh, for a recommendation or resolution uh, from council that uh, the mayor uh, create the special committee and it's just to educate them in regard to the content in that new official plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anybody have any um, questions on this? I do, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just so I understand, I, I think it's a great idea, Alex. Um, just so I understand the composition, uh, you mentioned three members of planning and one heritage. Right. Um, within that, um, are, are we talking like we have four on the planning and heritage committee, we have another five, six on the planning board, we have five or six on the heritage. So are we ta talking, taking three from all of those committees, any three or where are we taking them from? I just try, I'm trying to understand a little right. bit better what the composition would actually look like. So I'm recommending three from the planning board, and the reason that there's a difference between the planning board and heritage board, the heritage uh, uh, 
Heritage is dealt in sort of even in another bylaw. It's, uh, but, but there are provisions in the official plan, but it's a smaller section. The planning board deals with everything in the, that official plan. So every month we're going to planning board, every planning board member uh, uh, is, will, will be utilizing that document as right. to the rationale for uh, you know, whatever the staff decision is. We'll highlight that in the report, but the more they're informed in regard to uh, what we were trying to achieve in this new official plan, uh, the better it is for everyone. And, Okay. And, and they'll get as well, the, the planning board will see this whole document and they, at the same time the councils, uh, the, all of council seeing it, they'll likely be brought in at the same time. But uh, the way that I look at it is that, uh, you know, on a document like this, because there is a lot of material in it, uh, and, you know, the planning board is uh, uh, put together to take some of the pressure off of council, which is yeah. really busy and they've got a lot of things going on. So on the uh, planning board, uh, y you folks realize when you when uh, when you're at council, councilors will rely on Councilor Yankoff in regard to has this or, right. or is was the planning board comfortable with this? Yeah. Uh, but she is the go-to person for uh, th that peer group council, mm -hmm. and uh, the people who will be on uh, this little subcommittee uh, could be other planning board members. Will be asking the ones that are uh, just getting informed uh, when they see it in the future. Uh, you know, when you folks reviewed this. Were you comfortable? Uh, they'll be able to provide a little bit of feedback to, to the larger group because the larger group is not going to be able to uh, expend the time yeah. that's going to be required uh, to go through this. It's the same as uh, everybody that will be on this uh, this uh, little uh, special committee. Sometimes not everybody can make it, but, yeah. but it's just <clears throat> to provide a forum where we can try to inform uh, people as readily as possible as to what's going on. And then uh, whether it's a council member or another planning board member that's not on the committee, uh, when it goes out to the public, they, they may go to those people and say, well, look, uh, uh, I may have a concern over that. Uh, it was, what was the rationale before that? And at least some of the planning board members and council members uh, can uh, indicate uh, what the rationale was. They don't have to necessarily agree with it, but they understand sure. why that provision was put in. Very good. Thanks. Um, Alex, so if I hear you correctly, the planning committee would be on this Correct. little subcommittee. Right. A few planning board members so the, from yep. the community yep. and one from the heritage board from the community. Correct. But this this committee would, st all of the members, these Correct. four Correct. would be yep. on that. Right. It's another committee. Yep. yep. <clears throat> and Madam Chair, just oh, so, oh, where, where in addition to these four? Right, right, exactly. Okay, right. okay, sorry, okay, good. Good. And, and because this, this committee deals with a whole lot of things, this subcommittee is just dealing with that one item, the official plan and being provided you know, some context as to what, what is uh, in that document before we head to the public, which will be later in the spring. Okay. Alex, in terms of, uh, do you have a, a time frame where by 2025, it's going to be done, or 2024 backwards. Do you know, like, where? What's our, what's our time frame? Uh, uh, Madam you, Chair, uh, the uh, time frame is that uh, we will be heading to the public, uh, and I, the first meeting, I can clarify that as to the. Uh, we have a, a Gantt chart from the. Uh, from the consultant, and that's the weeks that everything is progressing, and uh, unless something gets delayed. But I think their intent was to head out maybe late April, early May to the public uh, for the consultation in the various wards. Uh, then we would, uh, uh, there, there's always a little bit of back and forth in regard to you know, what's happening there, and then it would be presented to uh, uh, council uh, late May or early June, and hopefully for a decision uh, in June. I know this is kind of a compressed time frame, but uh, uh, we did uh, receive some significant federal funding, and there is somewhat of a, uh, an expectation of when it will be completed. They, they may be flexible on that, uh, we, but we need to ensure that if it extends beyond the commitments uh, that we made to the federal government, that they're aware of it, and I make you aware of it, <laughs> that, they're, that they're comfortable if we need to go further beyond that date. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering, too, with our subcommittee, I, I see the planning board, they do have a vital role with our committee. And why are we why are we subdividing that down? Why are we not including them in the process as is? Is there a specific reason why? Or how you're going to even select if all of them are interested in being part? I think we would just ask who, uh, like every uh, committee, we would ask all of them who who would was willing to put their names forward, and uh, that, that typically on any committee that somebody wants to sit on a committee of council, and then the powers that be, the mayor or whoever is, uh, is the decision maker makes that decision. The only reason for the three is it just that this is going to take some time commitment, and we're hoping to, you know, I'm trying to be mindful of people's time, including your time, uh, and like I say, not everybody can maybe be able to make every meeting, but it's just a matter of we're going to uh, start meeting on a fairly regular basis, uh, you know, whether it was one more member of the planning board. Uh, I, I concur that I think it's really important that the planning board is the resident experts on the official plan and the zoning bylaw, and the more we can inform them as to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, they go to every public meeting. Uh, they have their ears to the ground in regard to a lot of these issues as well, but you know, there's, there's no magic in the, in the number other than it, it, it would be quite an expectation to ask them to attend every meeting. The other thing, too, is the bigger the meeting, the, the, the longer the meeting goes because there's more questions. Uh, so again, I mean, there's some flexibility in there, but that was just my suggestion. Yeah, because I do agree. I think you're right. They, they, that's their mandate is that they represent the wards in which they live. And sometimes I know it takes longer, but if you're going to do something right, personally, I'd be willing to take the time to make sure that we're we're getting as much information as we can for sure, and just ensuring that you know, obviously we'll have to bring this subcommittee to planning board for regular updates. It's going to, it's going to be the same time, just in different ways and wanting to make sure that their voices are heard. So Councillor McCabe, if I'm hearing you correctly, are you thinking that instead of forming a subcommittee, it would just be these regular meetings where the meeting notification will go out to planning committee, planning board and heritage, and in hopes that um, whoever can show up can show up and maybe some show up sometime, and then some, and then eventually it's the sharing of it. Is that what you mean? I'm just thinking that that makes sense that we at least offer that, and that but we're here every day. And so that, the, you, you know, the train's going to have to keep moving because, of course, we do have time constraints and things. But personally, I would like to at least see them if they're all interested. I wouldn't want to have to pick what resident members of the planning board should and shouldn't, but that's just my thought. I kind of liked uh, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Forbes' idea of asking the planning board and, and saying that this could be a, a every week, a two, a two or three hour, a two hour commitment every week for the next eight, ten weeks. Are, is anyone who is interested in doing that, please don't feel that you have to do it. Um, that type of thing. That, um, and that takes, now the issue, Your Worship, you will have with this is that the planning board is only in place until March 31st. You may, you may want to look at extending that until June 30th because you don't want to switch planning boards in the middle of this pro, or the whole planning board in the middle of this process. That's something you, you may want to take under advisement. Because of their also, corporate sorry, history? The plan, sorry, the planning board is in, is in place until you... Re, my, my mistake. Planning board is in place until you replace them, until they are replaced. Yeah. Under yeah. the Planning Act. They're different than under the MGA. Right, right. Because so, they're governed by the Planning Act. Yeah. 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 So, uh, it, but it, by, the continuity will be very important in this as well. Or the other option would be is if his worship had um, changes he was going to make, he could do that sooner as opposed to later. If you, if Except that we don't have the appointment policy, so... <laughs> They don't have what? The appointment policy in place to... Oh, mercy. Yeah, that's going back to uh, the Strategic Priorities and uh, Intergovernmental Cooperation Committee for review and should be presented at the regular monthly meeting in February. Yeah. But, Madam Chair, if I can just give you some background. Uh, this idea that uh, our manager spoke about has only evolved over the last two or three weeks um, before this meeting, he said that he would bring it up here at our planning committee meeting to get some feedback. Mm -hmm. So nothing is set in place yet. There's been no secret meetings. Everything's been up front, open and transparent. So 
I think Alex is coming from a planner's point of view. You look at three, if you leave it, if we go with the six members of planning board and the five members, or is it six members, five members of heritage board, four members of this committee, then you have 13 members could turn up for the meeting. So I think he was looking more at just reducing it. Everyone will be, all members on the planning board, heritage board, planning committee, we'll be educated because we'll be there, but it will be a continuum. I think the continuum is to get information discussed, get it filtered back to the full planning board, back to the full heritage board, and then and make sure that we get this official plan in place sooner than later. Yeah, my only objective is I just want to, before we go to the public, that, that the, the key people that I report to, which is council and the planning board, uh, they're just aware of what's in the document. Because, you know, uh, when you ask the public for their opinions and then we go out to the public and they start asking these key people, uh, they, they want to be able to, uh, some of them at least, uh, reasonably be able to respond in regard to the rationale for this section relates back to this, so, but, but, but you know, his worship is correct that uh, we also need to get all of the planning board, all of the heritage board, and then all of council up to speed uh, at the last uh, phase of this before we go to the public so that everybody's informed, but because of time constraints on everybody, it's just really hard to get council's attention for that and like the, all of council for that uh, length of time uh, that it's gonna take to uh, just to find out what's in that document. And I, I, thank you, but I appreciate all of that too. I just guess what I'm looking at when we're making new terms of reference and stuff for a subcommittee, making sure we're following the process that we have in place where people had to apply and then that, you know, are we able to do that with our existing heritage board or existing planning board without having to go and follow the process that we have in place when we form new committees with new terms of reference? No, again, these the planning board falls under the planning act. Okay. It 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 is it's it's an animal. It's 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 its own animal. It's 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 its own uh, mechanism to make decisions. But Donna, as former director of corporate affairs, she recalls. I recall when uh, Hap Stelling and Stelling and Catalog were commissioned to put together the official plan that we're still using today. I remember going to those meetings in 97 and 98, and they were large gatherings, and I don't think, you know, everybody, all, all, all the participants from City Hall were up to speed because questions were coming from everywhere. And it was talking about, Alex, rezoning Sherwood, West Royalty to R1 to R2 to R3. So it caused a lot of, uh, if you remember, Donna, a lot of, a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, long meetings too. So I think the objective or the purpose of Alex's idea is to get everyone educated so when we go to these public meetings and then we come to make a decision that we have all the material correct. to go forward, correct? Yeah, no, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, the, we, we just want to be as informed as we can before we had, or, or again, a, a group of people. Uh, there'll, there'll be lots that we will learn when we get out and uh, receive public feedback. And to the mayor's comment, we're not getting into zoning in this. This is, this is but it's the general future land use map, which is the precursor of zoning. It, it will infect zoning in the longer run. But anyway, I just think it's just prudent that we uh, we just get a, a core group together, get them up to speed before then we start informing all of the planning board, all of the heritage board and all of council. And uh, uh, you know, again, there's there's not an urgency on this, but I just thought it's important to, uh, you know, put this in place today. And uh, and we, we can amend that uh, resolution if we need to, to give uh, a give some, some more flexibility if we need to, but it's just a matter of we would just like to get that on to in front of council in regard to this subcommittee would be, be nice to just recognize uh, what it's there for. And it's only focused on that one document and it's just what's in it uh, and, and it's to be informed what's in it. Thank you. Okay, so we need a resolution then so that we can um, move this along. I think to you need a resolution so that to, to so that the the mayor can be uh, provided the the 
the, uh, the the direction to go ahead to do that, how he does it, or whatever the, the other bylaws are in regard to how you appoint those committees. But you know, we would take that to the full, uh, uh, or do we, or not. This would be an ad hoc committee with has a beginning and an end for a specific job, specific time. It may be, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing Councillor McCabe, you may want to go to planning board and says, who is interested in doing this? Yeah. Because a lot of people have other jobs, have other lives, and they may not be willing to put in like every, every uh, Tuesday night from, uh, from six till eight or four until six, uh, you know, because I think that that's what this is going to take, you know, the next eight weeks, Tuesday evening, and to have people coming in and out on it, that they, they won't understand why, well, oh no, we talked about that last week. <laughs> is that the point you're trying to make, uh, Councillor McCabe? Yeah, I just wanted, yeah. Okay. So I have um, just a little draft here that that we could for our resolution and it's just um, the resolution would just be a motion that the Planning and Heritage Committee recommend that the mayor appoint a subcommittee comprising the members of the Planning and Heritage Committee, three members of the Planning Board and one member of the Heritage Board. Um, if that's, that's a good starting point. Is that suitable to you, Councilor McCabe? Are you look like th this will go back to Planning Board. We will ask Alex yeah, um, who, who would be interested. And maybe maybe just to make it easier for you folks, I mean, it, 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 it just representation from the planning board and the heritage board. Uh, yeah. and, and then you, because of maybe something that maybe they are, they're all busy, but just to, to seek representation from the two boards and uh, that'll give us, or the mayor, some flexibility to have that discussion with uh, those that want to uh, participate. Yeah, so we'll yep. take the three and the one right, out right. of it. Yeah, yeah, that would work. That's better yep. than that but, way. His but could you say up to three, mm -hmm. up to one? Is that something you want to do or is that getting too specific? You know what, leave it open, leave yeah, it open. Leave it open, yep. And just put maybe a timeline that Please express your interest, but you'll configure out your timeline, your worship. But let's get it going. Staff, staff can get those requests out. Who's interested? And we'll give a little, you know, as to what, you know, you have some possible timelines and things like that. And uh, and we'll we'll see who who's interested, and we will uh, provide that to the mayor. So I think in the interest. Oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> did my job in. Uh, just in the interest of timeliness, I think if we're if we can get those names for our next meeting on February, whatever it is. Yeah, whatever that third, whatever it is. And I don't know whether that's doable or not, but I think if we're looking at the timelines, Alex, you were talking about, uh, you know, late April, early May, late May, early June. Um, I think we better get moving on this. Yeah, the, the, the consultants' timelines are to get feedback from staff by the 22nd of this month. So then, yeah, yeah. And the staff have seen this before. Staff have this is the second go around for staff. But 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 after the staff provide their input, uh, then we're into that closing onto a final draft, and then we should start to meet rel relatively quickly after the twenty second. Any time after the twenty second. So, and, 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 Alex, are you able to get an email out tomorrow and have some of them back by Monday, or is that too quick? That might be too quick, but uh, Ellen and I will work on it. And, and I, I will put in the caveat that another part of the work that's going to be required on this is the growth management. And the growth management is, I think you'll find the growth management interesting, but, but because the growth management is the, you know, uh, the precursor for the official plan and, and why some of those strategies are in there. And uh, Richard's committee has reviewed it. I think it's, well, I'll check into it. I think it's public now. So those will be the first couple of meetings and uh, on the, uh, we, we don't have to necessarily get into the official plan the first meeting, but I think explaining to the group as to what we're trying to achieve in the growth management study uh, is very valuable for the discussion we're going to encounter when, we, when you go to the public. Thank you. So do I have somebody to move that resolution? Moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor Beck. All those in favor? Could I just ask, Madam Chair? Certainly. So who will be facilitating these 
uh, task force meetings? You or do we have the consultants coming in? It's going to be a hybrid. Uh, they, 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 we may do some WebEx with them they, uh, for the meeting, but it'll be staff will be uh, bringing in sections uh, and uh, you know just just explaining uh, primarily. This is what this chapter is dealing with. This is the reason why. This is, ties back to a growth management study, and uh, and we will utilize our consultants as much as we can. I mean, they're. They're, they're committed to a certain amount of time, and, uh, and, and if we need some additional time for this important uh, endeavor, we will seek to achieve it. But uh, yeah, it, it's going to be the both of us trying to inform. And there's two different consultants on this as well, but uh, I'll, I'll handle the growth management uh, initially, and, and we will work to, uh, to uh, with our you know, uh, consultants. Uh, there's two consultants uh, for the OP to make sure that uh, you're aware of uh, you, you may ask me that uh, on sections that you might find complicated, that you ask me in a meeting, can you bring them back the next meeting to kind of go over this section because it's unclear to me and I, I can help you out in that regard. All right, thank you. If there's nothing else on the official plan update, we can move on to the short-term rental rollout implementation. So that would mean... <coughs> Okay, Alex. So, uh, if for those that are returning members of council, they'll uh, harken back to February of last year when we uh, made some decisions on the short-term rental uh, bylaw. There's a the, the staff report is. I think the meat of it. <laughs> There's a long. There was a. If you'll recollect, there was a lot of uh, appendices to that. Studies, reports, and things like that. Uh, the, the submissions by the public, but but it laid out the framework uh, how the city of Charlottetown wanted to move forward. The first, uh, what rolled out of that uh, direction was we made the amendments to the zoning bylaw as to where short-term rentals would be permitted in the city of Charlottetown. So that work has been done, uh, but at the same time, council granted a one-year moratorium to allow everyone who had an existing short-term rental the opportunity to continue to their operation and then to find out uh, during this one-year period where they might stand with this new bylaw and the approvals that are going to be required in the future. Uh, back in February of last year, there was uh, council also directed staff to bring in two uh, implementing bylaws uh, 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 to ensure that we could properly uh, license and enforce uh, the short-term uh, rental uh, requirements. One of them was the summary proceedings bylaw, and the summary proceedings bylaw uh, is is the direction that's provided to council for certain types of offenses. You know, what, what, you know what, what is the level of fine you can levy on a type of an offense? So short-term rentals is a new entity. Uh, we're working with our city solicitors on the summary proceedings bylaw to ensure that it reflects the uh, this new reality of short-term rentals. And then the other bylaw is the licensing bylaw. And the, the key thing is, is that uh, after March 28th of this year, you're going to be required to seek a license from the city of Charlottetown in order to run your operation. So if you don't have a license, it will uh, then trigger the uh, summary proceedings by law, which is, will be fining or taking you to court. So those documents are being worked on by uh, uh, our solicitors and staff. We hope to have them uh, in front of you Hopefully, uh, late uh, next month. We don't want to run that rate up till uh, till the last minute, but we are finalizing it. Those we've been working on those documents for some time, hoping hoping to get those completed. And there's been a little bit of a flurry of uh, activity requests uh, in the community in regard to short-term rentals. The reason for that is that. Uh, what has happened since we went down this road is that one of the concerns was in the past is the province was issuing licenses for short-term rentals, but they weren't getting the approval from the city. So uh, there's new legislation that the province has to ensure that before they issue a license that, that somebody in a municipal jurisdiction has also provided that 
person a license before they can get the provincial license. So why there's been some interest in the community is the uh, provincial government has uh, sent out to everyone in the city that if you uh, obtained a license last year, please be advised as of March 28th, there are new regulations in the city of Charlottetown. You will be required to get a license from the city before you can get a license from us. So that's these STR operators are getting those letters from the province and now they're starting to ask questions. So uh, from my point of view, uh, we are on track as we, from the strategy that was laid out last March, we will bring those implementing documents to you, uh, hopefully late March, make sure that they're in place. Uh, for the anticipated rollout uh, at the end of March. And we are working uh, quite regularly with the province to make sure that the, the two of us are uh, working with, it, it's the same uh, client, but they need two different licenses. And uh, you know, hopefully uh, you know, we can uh, just get this done, get it uh, rolled out on time, and, uh, uh, and then work with our provincial counterparts to make this as uh, uh, easy as possible for those seeking to uh, obtain a uh, short-term rental uh, license in the city of Charlottetown. Thank you. Anybody have, um, go ahead. Lots, I got lots of questions. Go ahead to your worship. <clears throat> cool. So, Madam Chair, just to go back to what Mr. Forbes said, last February, we passed two bylaws, uh, no, we, we the last February you directed staff to prepare two bylaws, which you will have to approve, which is the licensing bylaw and the summary proceedings bylaw, and that will come forward hopefully end of February. Uh, these are not public meetings type of uh, 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 bylaw amendments, but but you know, they are the implementing components of the STR strategy. So the bylaw to <clears throat> go forward with a. Summary proceedings bylaw is number one. The second bylaw will be the licensing bylaw. Right. So, Alex, what did council pass in February of 2022? So, uh, the the key thing at that time was the uh, people were uh, people were wanting to know where we were going to recognize them in the city of Charlottetown, and, and that decision was made. So, the land use part of it is done. The There's what? The land use part, the zoning bylaw provisions, it's very clear uh, now uh, as of the, you know, the bylaw amendments that came out of last February indicating where a short-term rental uh, will be uh, uh, per per permitted, permissible in the city. There's some other conditions. We placed that up on the website in uh, light of some recent uh, requests in regard to, uh, you know, this, this concern of this uh, impending date, two and a half months. Uh, so. Uh, you know, we're, we're again on track to uh, to uh, ensure that people are properly licensed at the end of uh, uh, March. But people know already if they're going to be permitted or not yeah. uh, in, in a certain locale of, of the city. Yeah, and Madam Chair, I think that's the issue out there. There's, it's not clear what was passed in February, but my understanding what we passed in February was to say, here's what a short-term rental means in terms of applying for a license, correct? It's, uh, so, some of that will show up in the uh, licensing li bylaw. Licensing bylaw. The, the, under the zoning bylaw, these we've always had uh, provision in the zoning bylaw from my entire time here, and likely we've well uh, back. It's it's they were always referred to as a tourist home, so those provisions have always been in the bylaw. So there was some actually some relatively minor tweaks to that to ensure that this would work uh, in the zoning bylaw uh, under the definition of tourist home. The issue was historically for planners and across the country was, it was the time frame. You could always, you, you know, you can always rent your home for a year, but it's the fact that it's when we moved into, uh, and it's not necessarily an Airbnb 
by, uh, by law. They're, they're the big provider, but yeah, it, it, it's renting your house for these short-term periods of time, which was sort of a relatively new entity. So it's the short-term nature of these rentals that uh, communities are trying to uh, ensure that is clear in regard to where you can do that and where you can't. So uh, that part of it's done. Uh, it has provided clarity. A lot of people uh, are, are fairly knowledgeable that they will not be recognized uh, under uh, our, our changes. Because if you own multiple properties, you can only utilize your principal residence for a short-term rental operation. So you can, you know, I, I, if I own eight, eight properties, uh, I might own them all, but there's only one that I live in, my principal residence. That's the only one that I can use as an SDR. And, and Madam Chair, if I can just keep, I, got, I have a few questions. I know that Councillor McKay may have some questions in yourself. But in, in February of 2022, this council, or the past and former council, passed the enabling legis municipal legislation to go forward with these two. Uh, forthcoming bylaws, the summary proceedings bylaw and the licenses bylaw. Right. So that's the enabling legislation has been completed. We know what what's required now to operate a short term rental, not an Airbnb or VBR. It's or VRB is it? But it 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 this is a short term rental and it has to be a principal your principal residence. And on the summary proceedings bylaw, if I look at Halifax's bylaw. They, they, they have legislative power through their, the Nova Scotia Planning Act. Is that why you have to go back the, to the legislature to change the Planning Act to allow the city of Charlottetown or any municipality in Prince Edward Island yeah, the powers to uh, create a summaries proceedings bylaw? No, we already have, the city already has a summary proceedings bylaw. We, that, that's a corporate bylaw that presently exists. Right. Uh, the, and again, that doesn't, that doesn't exist uh, uh, right now to deal with STRs. So all we're go going to do is go into that corporate bylaw where all our finding ability is under fire, uh, bylaw infractions, all, all of that which is currently exists, but we need to put in the sections dealing with uh, short-term rentals, and there'll be some reference in that you need a license, and if you don't have a license, then that, that will trigger the enforcement, uh, whether it's a fine or uh, taking people to court. So uh, there's three pieces of it. The zoning bylaw is done. That's where they are. Uh, the summary proceedings bylaw is a corporate bylaw, not exclusive to short-term rentals. Uh, we're not asking the province to change anything. Uh, we're going to have to work within the confines of their existing uh, uh, powers that they provide us. And then the licensing bylaw, it just requires you, uh, it's like a building permit, to post on your property. If you've received a license and you're the neighbor uh, and you're wondering what's happening next door, you should be able to walk in front of that property and see up there a number that, for, saying City of Charlottetown, uh, that they, they, are, they are licensed to utilize that property for a short-term rental. And we will likely as well have a front-facing uh, on our website uh, those that have been approved and not approved. So if you're wondering if your neighbor's got an approval, there could be some delay in the paperwork, but you can go online and you could say, does Mr. Brown, my neighbor, uh, have uh, approval for a short-term rental? Because I don't see the, the, the little number, the registration up in the front window. And, uh, uh, and again, I'm just curious as to whether they've got their, their approval from the, the, the city. Uh, and if they don't have one from the city, they clearly don't have one from the province. So those are just the, the pieces of the moving parts to ensure that when, when uh, the moratorium it ends that we have the tools to make sure that people comply really is what were those last two pieces I think for clarification um, Alex and Mary your worship you correct me if I'm wrong I know from your perspective you're looking at enforcement from STR and that's the piece that you're taking because that was the direction you were provided and I think I'm understanding because I know we've had many discussions in planning board around what happens when people don't follow processes set out so it's a little bit bigger than the the STR from what I'm understanding is we still want to include if I 
apply for a permit and I don't follow the rules in the permit, we've always been told, you know, we have to wait, we have to go to court, we really can't do anything. Oh, they've put the building up, there's nothing we're going to really be able to do. So really in perspective, why do we have bylaws? Because people who choose not to follow the bylaws, there's no real consequence that we have um, the capability to do. So while we're doing this enforcement bylaw, I think we need to include some of that if you're doing a bylaw, we might as well include those things. I think that's, maybe I'm wrong, Your Worship, you can clarify it, but I think we've had so many discussions around what happens when, and now that we're into the kind of the nits, and maybe it's not under planning for all of it, and maybe it's under police because we work like that and we work in 5,000 different ways, but at the end of the day, when people are, we have these rules as, as, a, as a city, and when people are following the rules, how do we, how do we, enforce that. Yeah, it, it, Madam Chair, that's exactly the point I'm making. If you go to the Halifax bylaw, it says if you put up a accessory building without a permit, the minimum is 100, the maximum is 500. But and, 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 and Mr. Forbes is right, we do have a summary proceedings bylaw, but it talks about, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing there that pin, pinpoints or directs our bylaw, uh, bylaw enforcement officer or police, because they can enforce bylaws too, to go to a home and say, "Here's a ticket. You put up in a, you constructed a, a, an accessory building without a permit, two hundred and fifty dollars." That, that's what I'm asking for, and I've been asking for that. We've been asking for that because we've been together now for the last two and a half years plus, asking for this summary proceedings bylaw that has minimum fine, maximum fine, because what. Councillor McCabe said, we've had that situation come to this chamber, and Donna, you remember working on past planning boards, yeah, okay, we can't do much, you know, we can go to court, but look, just don't do it anymore, slap in the hand. So that's what I'm asking about. Is that, we're clear on that, all three of us? That's what I understand it to be for, for regulation, and again, how do we, how do, we do that, that so, piece? Is that what it is? It is, but the reality is it's the province who sets the fines. They're the ones, there's a range. Uh, you, 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 right, you, yeah. you, you have to line up with the provincial uh, fining uh, schedules, as the, the mayor has alluded to, and uh, STRs will f show up in that schedule in one place, uh, maybe a fire infraction shows up somewhere, and they also list the fining, the range of the fines. So we're, we're just lining up to, to uh, uh, the legislation that has been provided to municipalities, but we just need to clarify when it comes to STRs, what are the tools we're gonna to use if you do not have a proper license, and then what will be the fining range, and then because if you don't pay the fine, you'll be going to court. So, uh. so, so my question then would be for clarification. Uh, enforcement, when I think of that, I think of our enforcement officers under policing. Would would this bylaw not be better suited to go under policing and incorporate everything rather than... It's, uh, uh, Mr. Hooley has been looking at it, like we've had multiple meetings with other staff, but the reality is that already exists. So uh, the, the same tools are gonna be there. It doesn't exist in the sense we can, we have no, and we've been told this, we have no ability to enforce. It might exist on paper, that, but there's no, Ticketing, you cannot, inf you, right? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but this is what I've been told, is that you cannot go in. So if it exists, I'm not sure where it is, and it's not. we're not enforcing it, so it might as well not exist, from it's, what I understand. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll be briefing you when we bring forward the summary proceedings bylaw, but those tools presently are there. That They're there, and they're being used by some departments. I, I guess there, there could be some lack of understanding that we have a whole lot more power. When we're moving into this territory, it's coming exclusively from the province. So we have to follow those provincial schedules, those requirements, line up with them, mm -hmm. and Mr. Hooley's aware of them, but we provide so many different services Planning is one. Uh, the uh, uh, the bylaw enforcement officers are dealing with multiple ones. The fire department comes under a different bylaw, and the schedules are all a little different. But David is aware of that, uh, and to the mayor's uh, uh, point of view, and I I've always already always indicated that look, my job is to get you uh, an STR <laughs> provision in into the, whatever the, the it's the current one. We can 
continue to uh, to massage that to to improve it, but it's just a matter of. Uh, uh, I think there's a, a, an understanding that there is more power in there than pre previously existed. It's the same power. It's just a matter of uh, uh, providing the clarity uh, that we're going to use that those tools this way with these schedules to ensure that in just in regard to my little world, STRs, that if you end up in court, uh, that we've got a good bylaw in place that uh, that we can enforce that component. Uh, and David is aware of fires, their tools, uh, but it's it, it, the, the task is bigger and bigger. That doesn't mean we can't in, uh, continue in, to improve the holistic hmm. uh, uh, summary proceedings bylaw. But but what I need to do for you folks, because I got a clock ticking, <laughs> uh, I need to make sure that at a minimum we come forward with the, uh, those provisions under the existing tools, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 maybe David is ready to to add some more components to that. I'll I'll defer to David on that. But but he's aware that we we holistically want. Uh, uh, we want to uh, leverage the finding ability uh, to the furthest extent we can across the corporate spectrum. And I would like to see, and maybe it's more directed towards the CAO than as far as where this goes, or I would like to see if I am somebody and I want to click on summary ticket of fencing, I'd like to be able to Google that in the City of Charlottetown website and something pop up to say, here's all the infractions that you're eligible to be enforced with and know that here's what your maximum and minimum fine would be and know who's going to enforce that. Like it's very, it's very, I, I appreciate that this is planning and this is an STR piece. This isn't really your wheelhouse, but I think it shouldn't be, this is planning, this is fire. That's, that's just way too silos. I think we need to be able to put that all under one spot and know exactly if you do this and here's your consequence, here's the potential consequence. And I don't know if I'm wrong, but it, it just, it, it shouldn't be this difficult. It, it, but it is, and I, and I don't mean to overly complicate it, but it, it's all of these different, the fire department operates, their enforcement tools, they have more powerful tools than I have because they deal with life safety issues. So they're, they're granted these powers and fining powers and eviction powers. Uh, because of the Community Planning Act, which I operate under, there's a lot less clarity. So every uh, the dangerous and unsightly bylaw is another bylaw, and it, it, it's, it flows from the province as well. So we can't exceed the authorities. We can change our bylaw a little bit, but we can't exceed what they give us. So although it may appear that it's it's just one bylaw. It's it's a, a myriad of provincial legislation that needs to be weaved together, uh, and, and Mr. Hooley is very aware. And to, to to the mayor's point, every time I meet the, Mr. Hooley, I say this is the expectation of the mayor. So you know he's aware of that. We've had these interdepartmental meetings, but uh, uh, you know and. We'll see what, what he comes up with, we just, but we just want to make sure that I have an STR piece in there for in the, any infraction on April 1st. So, ma Madam Chair, so Section 230 of the Municipal Government Act of Prince Edward Island, application of Summary Proceedings Act. We know it's there. We know it's in our, in our own bylaws. So, come April 1st, I'm operating a... STR. I don't have the little sticker on my window. Our bylaw enforcement officer goes out. Does he or she give this person a summons that would say, because you're operating a, a STR without a license, you're paying a minimum fine of $250. Here's the court date if you want to uh, uh, plead guilty or not guilty. Is that correct? That correct. will be, correct. that's how right, it will right, be. Right. I'm, I'm Donna? Not sure, I'm not sure that it will be exactly on April 1st. It may be April 15th or, or something like that before we, before. And it may not be 250. May, <laughs> yeah, no, but the other thing is, is that we have to have proof too. It's just like if I get caught speeding here going home tonight, I'm going to get caught by a radar and the, and the police officer is going to say, you were going 70 in the 50. Uh, if I got, you know, I have to blow, uh, if I get caught for impaired driving, um, all those types of things. So just because my, the neighbor next door says that I'm operating uh, an, uh, an STR, um, 
doesn't mean that the police are going to just come out and give me a ticket and I'm going to have a choice of paying it or fighting it. Um, there's going to have to be some proof as well. Yeah. Okay, so let me clarify. Let me clarify it. So a neighbor reports on his or her neighbor that they're operating an STR. They don't have the license on the window. Police go out, knock on the door. Uh, Sir, ma'am, where's your license? I don't have one. Okay. Well, so you have two cars in your driveway, and you have three people from with baggages all over the place. They're relatives. Uh, I, I, I guess, folks, we're, we're could be could be at my house. Right. I think that right. We're getting the, into the meat of it. Uh, the, the tools are going to be in the licensing bylaw. You folks will be deciding. You'll see step by step by step what constitute constitutes a violation, and that, that will all be in the bylaw, and I think it's going to be much clearer. But would it not be, if there's going to be a licensing number, no one has to go knock at a door, because you can just click on the computer in the database, Th that's and all, that That's all a part right of what will be in the licensing bylaw. That that, somebody, that's where, that, that's where your, your, right. the, the genesis of your conviction will flow from, your advertising without a license, which we will validate, that you know because we can check very quickly. So, Right, yeah. right. No, Don, I understand the proof, but I'm just saying, I, we, for the past four years for planning board, and when I was on planning board as a counselor, accessory buildings were going up, or the bylaw wasn't followed or, or adhered to, and the, the manager at the time, Hap Stellan, would say, well, we can go to court, you know, we can try to get this person convicted under the, the legal system. This is much simpler. There's a ticket, and you can... Uh, uh, plead guilty or not guilty, and then it's up for you. It's up to the the, the, the defendant to defend his or her position. Yeah, I think that's what the, the manager is saying: is that it will all be laid out in the bylaw. If I'm advertising on my Airbnb, and uh, you know, and and Julie calls in on me, there's the proof: is I'm advertising and I don't have a license. But if I'm not on Airbnb and if I'm not on VBRO and if I'm not on any, and and my neighbor calls in on me. A little bit more difficult, but that's what's going to be in the bylaw. The standards of proof will be there as well, I, I would expect. So just for last, last point on this, while we're doing this uh, summary enforced ticketing piece under planning, even things like we've had lots of discussion in planning board and stuff with these pool fences, for example. Just deal with STR right now. Let's just deal with STR. Let's get this through now. So, so um, what do we... Uh, Oh, sorry, Madam G Councilor McCabe, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that, you know, for four years we've been listening to frustration around what do we do with it when people aren't following the rules. So I, I know we're dealing with STR, but we've got legal in helping us, and it is under planning. I'm just struggling with why we can't try to put it all into one spot. We will I'll bring that up with, <laughs> with uh, Mr. Hooley. He's aware of it. I mean, it's, and again, this isn't, this isn't a new discussion. He's aware of what we would like to do, but it, it's just uh, uh, lawyers are cautious, and lawyers, uh, when they provide something, they want to ensure that it is uh, well vetted and that their success in court, because th these finding, if you don't pay a fine, you're going to court, and that's... That's always how things work. So uh, he he's, he's he's he will he will give us what he can give us in regard to the, you know the, these concerns. I keep telling him uh, just work on my SDR, but this is what the mayor and others would like us to do holistically. So that's being worked on. You'll be able to see these tools for SDR, and, and uh, you'll be he'll be available at the time it's being put through. And if you have any other questions in regard to the corporate side of it, uh, he may have some some uh, amendments in there for some departments that he feels that is easy to kind of put in, but uh, I will reaffirm with him your interest to have it across the board. Uh, but again, those provisions are still in there. I'll, I'll, I think there's an expectation that there's a whole lot going to change. It's the same process. You fine, you don't pay the fine, you go to court. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what will be, you'll see it in the licensing bylaw. So Madam Chair, just last point, this is the final point. Um, I know with the province, under their summary proceedings bylaw, if you're fined, 
let's say for uh, dangerous goods in your home and you don't go to court and you skip court, provincially they can um, suspend your license, your driver's license. They can, there, there are other levels, uh, le uh, levers or lever, levers of, of, of enforcement. So that's why I've been asking about, will it fall under Schedule B, right. Schedule A of the Planning Act so that that's a possibility of using those levers of enforcement? That those have all been looked at, and we realize that they have a lot better levers because they control the levers. <laughs> so uh, they're much more friendly with giving themselves levers than to municipalities. So the, the like you're jumping from now you're over into motor vehicle, but 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 they because they are the province and they oversee all legislation. Uh, but we have to rely on enabling legislation, and if it's not enabled to make those changes to say that you will you, we can suspend your license or whatever, you're using the same tools that have always been there, and it's primarily it'll be the court system that will say you 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 were in breach of this, you were fined, maybe they give an additional fine, I'm not certain, but but those, uh, we have to work with that enabling by, or the labeling legislation as it pertains to different departments. I work under the Planning Act, and it's got to be enabled in the Planning Act on these fines. So there's not one comprehensive tool that just says the city can just uh, universally apply all of these uh, bylaw enforcement tools uh, universally. So, but we 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 we're, we understand the issue. I'm focused on SDRs <laughs> and planning, and but David's aware of uh, Mr. Hooley, uh, Cox and Palmer are aware of the desire. He has been meeting with the other department heads on those things that they enforce, and he's trying to see what can be done at the same time, if it's possible, to bring that in in tandem with. Uh, the, the amendments coming from planning, if we can improve uh, the, uh, the robust nature of our ability to obtain compliance on all of our bylaws. So again, Madam Chair, we've been drilling down on this issue for the last two and a half years. So if I look at the Nova Scotia or Halifax legislation, my understanding is that it's linked to provincial um, provincial uh, levers of, of enforcement. S have we, like I've asked, have we checked or verified or looked at other best practices in other municipalities like Halifax or like Fredericton? Like, have we, because the reason I say that, uh, Mr. Forbes, is that if we do give a fine and we go to court, what lever of power do we have to get to, to collect that fine? Like it's it well that's the issue and that's and it, see that's but, but 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 that the province hasn't enabled us to do no I I know that but, that that but that's why I I I've, I've been asking about this for the last two and a half plus years have we looked at like I I just gone I'm I'm online looking at Halifax and Nova Scotia's uh, uh, legislative uh, legislative powers relating to Halifax bylaws. There's a link there, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I've been asking, did we ever verify if the province of Nova Scotia gave the enabling power to Halifax that if someone didn't pay a fine for storing dangerous goods in his or her home, that if the fine wasn't paid, provincial uh, levers of enforcement would kick in? Like, have, Did we ever check, check into that? Yay or nay? I would say nay, because the the fact is, it, it, it's provincial legislation. It's uh, no, a, a, Alex. No, I know that. Yeah. I I know that, and, and I I understand the difference. We're we're not an order of government. We're right, we're, right. we're 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 a creature of provincial legislation. Right, legislation. Right. So is Halifax. So is Liverpool, Yarmouth, Moncton, Toronto. I know that. But in terms of trying to make that to make this work. Those lever of powers, levers of enforcement, have to be there, or we're going to be, you know, saying, "Look, if we go to court, it's going to cost this much money. We're going to get our return by going to court." I think we're we're just again beating the same drum with the existing bylaws, and we were told, Donna, and at that this was at the last meeting. We were all there at the last meeting, the public consultation over at the Confederation Center. 
If it wasn't sent, said once, it was said twice, three times, r repeatedly, that if you're going to put a, a municipal bylaw in to regulate short-term rentals, make sure the enforcement is there. If it's not there, we're all just wasting our time. And I mean, enforcement needs those lever of enforcements that the province has when it comes to if you don't pay a fine. Well, I, I, again, look, I understand. I worked in a different province and for a lot of years, and it's the same thing. They, they just don't empower municipalities to, uh, it was the exact, pretty near the exact same process, the issues that we have. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, we tried, you know, well, anyways, I mean, uh, another province, we, we tried fining. Uh, we, we had a provision in the bylaw, <laughs> went to court, we lost. You can't fine. That's what we were told. You cannot fine. Uh, we fine. You don't fine. <laughs> but but it had to do with a planning issue, right? So that's the complexity of this. Uh, when you look at it across the board, now we will have the ability to fine on short-term rentals, and we will be able to take people to court. It will be meaningful uh, to be able to enforce the bylaw. We we have a every expectation that we can, you know, we, we can get people through it, but it, it's just not as straightforward as you would think, that, it, that, it, that they, you give them a ticket and they pay. Uh, but but those, those are the same tools that have always existed. So, Madam Chair, I'm going to just end with this. Thank you for your patience, but all of you. I'm, I will follow up uh, with the City of Halifax and ask what type of, what is their legislation when it comes to their bylaws, and what enabling legislation do they have from the province if they do or don't. And I will bring it up at our next meeting under business arising from the minutes. Thank, thank you, Your Worship. I think just circling back to the um, updates on STR and some of the um, questions coming out of the public now, there seems to be a bit of a misconception around the idea that um, that the changes to the zoning and development bylaw have not already taken place, but they have already taken place in February. Correct. So that's that's already there, but but the moratorium was granted to those that have existing STRs to continue while they get their ducks in a row over the next year until March 28th. Is that correct? I'm looking at Ellen. <laughs> what, what was your comment, Ellen? No, right. Because we gave a one-year grace period. Right. But, but the key component of it, if you were, if if you were paying attention, if you're an STR operator, you know, or if you're paid attention to any of this discussion, you know whether you're going to be, uh, you have to be in a single detached dwelling, uh, you have to be principal resident, uh, those 10 conditions which uh, uh, that uh, you, you've reviewed. Uh, but but the, the, the moratorium, again, allowed the, the public to uh, make other decisions. If they, if they were not going to be uh, permitted uh, in April 1st of this year, they could go to long-term rental. So, uh, but, it, but these enabling, it all comes into force and effect on that date with these enabling bylaws. We will, you know, there'll likely be fees associated. Council's gonna have to determine what is gonna be the annual fee for short-term rental. So it'll all be in those bylaws and then the enforcement component starts, uh, uh, you know, after the, these other two documents are approved and after March 28th. And was there not, um, what about the tourist levy? How is that being collected on STRs? That is something that I've, uh, I don't have anything to do with the tourist levy, and it's my understanding that, right, right, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. Right, the, yeah. we, we, it's my understanding, but that, that's dealt with by. Economic development. Right, but, but I'm pretty confident that they're not, well, they're, they're not collecting the levy at, at present. Uh, Mr. Long, uh, I'll deal with Mr. Long in regard to whether they want to or not, but I don't think that they, I don't think we are intending to collect a levy. Madam Chair, with this STR, short-term rentals regulation framework is doing, it sets up a organized body that will identify licensing through the city 
And if Discover Charlottetown or Economic Development want to look at applying the TAL to all these licensed TA, uh, licensed STRs, then that will have to be uh, affected by administ city administration. That's that's that that has to be in place. A bylaw has to be in place before and and act active before that we go to the next step, which is use uh, applying the, the TAL to licensed STRs. We had an exa uh, apparently Airbnb was ch charging a, a towel here in Charlottetown, but it was on the website, but it, they weren't actually charging it. We had a discussion on this just recently in the past month, um, that they were, char it, it appeared that they were charging a towel on Airbnb that were being rented here over the past month. We looked into it. Um, it they were not actually charging it, though it appeared that it, they were. That, but it is a discussion that will have to occur. Okay, well, there's, we could probably talk about this for many more hours. I mean, I think that we do need to be available to the residents to answer questions, even though we've been through this many times over the last two years. There's still, people are asking the same questions or they're not clear on it. So we just need to be available to make sure that everyone is very clear on what we've done already, because there is a misconception out there that that, that it hasn't been done yet. Um, I don't know, Your Worship, if you're hearing that. No, I, not, um, Madam Chair, I am hearing that. But what Alex told us this evening is that the STR bylaw was passed February of 2022. Z zoning bylaw. Yeah. No, 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 no. There's no STR bylaw. No, no, it's sorry. Changes to the zoning, zoning and bylaw. development bylaw that defines an STR as your principal residence. So that's already that's already been checked off. Now we have two more bylaws. One for the summary proceedings bylaw, which will give the city or planning or the police the power to issue tickets if someone is not uh, 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 respecting the the zoning development bylaw under STRs. And then the second one, Alex, to clarify, we have to p pass a licensing bylaw for anyone seeking a permit to operate an STR within the framework of our zoning development bylaw. Is that correct, Alex? Yeah, the, the licensing bylaws a little bit, out, it's outside of the zoning bylaw, but one is land use, one is business permits inside the city, which is licensing, and the summary proceedings bylaw is always there, but it'll have provision for SDRs, and it will, it will link back to the licensing bylaw, because uh, you're, you've, there's an infraction because you didn't follow the licensing bylaw. And then you're in violation of the zoning bylaw as well. So anyway, that will all be laid out by Mr. Hooley. We're meeting on Friday to get things really moving. Uh, Don has been very, uh, uh, very adamant <laughs> to, uh, you know, get, get, get this finalized as quickly as possible. And it's also, I think, uh, the CAO's uh, concern is, is that, you know, we, we do the same thing with, with these, these tools that you're going to be approving so that when you explain to the public uh, that uh, you're aware of, of what's in the licensing bylaw, so we don't want to wait right till the last minute to bring them forward. We'll try to get to them to you well in advance so you can review those tools to make sure that you understand them. If a resident says, well, well what, if, what if this happens? You'll say, well, it's covered in the licensing bylaw. A nice flow chart would be lovely. Just something really simple, because this is an awful lot of information, and we have been doing this for two years, and every time I'm like, I think I understand. I don't know if I understand. And I have been privy to all the conversations. So I don't know if we can do a simple flow chart, but you were just saying, and one connects here, and, and just something to kind of break it down simple. I know. There's nothing simple. I know <laughs> there's not, but a little bit of a... Uh, that, that could be me. <laughs> well, no, it's just because you're you're so familiar. Like this is your language, but no. for someone that it's not their language, I think that's what the, the chair is saying is sometimes it's a little bit more confusing. And for the people that are operating Airbnbs, they just want to. They don't want any change. So everybody, you know, it's just so we all have the same message as simple as possible. And, and Madam Chair, again, uh, you've given us a lot of uh, latitude in this discussion. I think this is what's was needed and it probably will, will there, there will be follow-up but it's important to remember 
This started back in 2019. Our first meeting took place at the Memorial Hall. Remember that first meeting? Our second meeting took place in the Confederation Center Main Theater uh, because of COVID-19. Our third meeting took place in the Confederation Center Main Theater. We've had lots of discussion, lots of work that went into this issue, but to simplify it, what was passed in February of 2022 was an amendment to the Zoning Development Bylaw to define short-term rentals and what we're looking at for the next phase, phase two of this process, is to pass a summary proceedings bylaw. That's our lever of enforcement. And then the license and bylaws so that we know who's licensed and who's not licensed. But in terms of what was done, that STR piece is already done. That was done back in February of 2022. Thank you, Your Worship. That really basically summed it up. Wouldn't, wouldn't hurt if that didn't go out in the PSA, right, to the, to the community, because it, you just summed it up in exactly the language that we needed to understand it. So thank you for that. Okay, should we ask Councillor Beck back in the room, and we'll move on to our next item. I wonder, I wonder if he left. <laughs> thank you. It was a good conversation, and I think, uh, Madam Chair, we're all getting calls. All councillors are getting calls, and I think that you're right. We have to get the information out there to inform the public is that our planning department has been moving forward, and I understand Councillor McCabe's uh, point about talking about the TAL. That's a separate issue that will be led by other powers that be about collecting that uh, TAL. Thank you. All right. Welcome back, Councillor Beck. <laughs> um, our next item for discussion, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, um, our manager of planning. And uh, in our last meeting of council, Councillor Tweel had a question around depreciation of property values. And so Alex is just here to just give a brief report on, on that for us to take back for Councillor Tweel. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I mean, this is somewhat of a, of, of a legal question, and it's not, not necessarily my domain, but all I can do is convey that I've been doing this for way too long. <laughs> and uh, the reality is, you know, like pe people use that debate repeatedly, that loss of property value. Uh, every time I've been in a meeting, people have been informed, if you can get a real estate land appraiser, not a real estate agent, one has got a lot different standards that are applied to them uh, and they have a science to that that if you can pr produce that in front of a council that a council would look at it i've never seen one because they're very hard to do to show that in some cases it's the opposite happens sometimes that these land uses that are adjacent to uh, the neighbor may not like it but because the the property next door is commercial they may be residential it may come back on that assessment that their property is more valuable because it's anticipated they may be rezoned and and come into the, the into the fray so the bottom line is is that this is in Canada, we, we don't use this tool a lot. People have always got, have got the ability to go to court and uh, indicate that uh, something has happened. We may downzone a piece of property as a part of a zoning by law review. If somehow that that was done in a manner that was deemed to be uh, procedurally unfair or uh, uh, created a hardship, they have the ability to uh, to contest that. But uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, planners don't get into that issue. Uh, zoning applications go to council. Uh, I hate to say it, but some people, depending on who you are, some feel that they're winners <laughs> because they, they get a rezoning that, that is, it increases the value of the land. But it's rare, and planners are very careful not to, uh, to introduce or support a land use for the neighboring property if we feel that they're uh, re realistically going to be compromised. So uh, it, it's, a, it's something that comes up a lot from residents. I think they hear just in the community, oh, well, I wouldn't want to be beside that. 
that, but it's very hard to prove that because of these these relatively small zoning changes that, that you can uh, definitively uh, have someone in authority, meaning a real estate appraiser, indicate that there's been a loss of property. Because they, they have to validate that in science. So that's all I can uh, add at this time, uh, Madam Chair. Anybody have anything else on that? or? I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking that it wouldn't be something the city would ever be taken on to do a jurisdiction jurisdictional scan or evaluation of people's personal properties on whether or not something happened. So I think there really doesn't have a whole lot more discussion time needed. Okay, thank you for that. So the um, final item in the open session is the renewal of the pedestrian mall agreement. So that is um, Victoria Row, where we close off the streets from May to end of October. The, um, the agreement needs to be renewed. It's been, I guess it's been up for renewal for about six months now? Yeah, it, 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 it expired at the end of the last season. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's an agreement we have with the uh, uh, merchants <coughs> down there and the, and the traveling public. There's a couple of issues there in regard to blocking of the sidewalks. It's always been in there. We continue to enforce that. Uh, the only the only reason that uh, it needs to be here now is that uh, I need to extend this or amend it. Uh, it doesn't have to. If you're not comfortable, if you would like a, uh, additions to it, you can take it away. You can come back to me. I just need to have this in place for the next season. It's in May. Uh, so uh, I just thought I'd bring it to your attention that I'm I'm going to I, I'm not in a position to renew the contract myself. So I'm just putting this on the table. It needs to be renewed for another five years. If you want to take the document away and just read the pedestrian bylaw uh, 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 that was put in place, if you have any suggestions, you can ask staff to look at it, or you can just say please uh, send it to council uh, and go from 2022 to. 2027 or 28 or whatever that is. Thank you, Alex. So, committee, what do you want to do for that? Go ahead, Councilor. I, I just have a question. Um, I'm wondering, Alex, where uh, with the uh, forgive me if I have the name wrong, but Province House Historic District, uh, whatever it is. When I looked at uh, the one that's coming up about uh, that building up around Province House and reconfiguration and all that. Yeah, yes, yeah, that one. Um, and I know when in looking at those uh, architectural renderings, there was some, it kind of appeared to me that there was some changes being made. Victoria Row was going to be kept, but it looked like there was going to be some changes. Does this um, renewal of the pedestrian agreement or anything like that, does it, any way pose any conflicts or uh, impediments or anything like that with that? Uh, I know we're, we'll be going through a, uh, you know, it's an open house uh, tonight, right? And um, so uh, I'm just wondering if there's any, does this get muddled because of the potential work that might be coming out of that uh, new initiative? Well, I'm on the way to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> after this meeting, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Murphy is on that list of uh, Mr. Murphy, uh, Kevin Murphy. Uh, uh, they, they, he represents or has historically, not always, but sometimes represents the merchants uh, or a number of the merchants there. So, uh, you know, we, we will look at that this evening to ensure that, that it doesn't. Uh, Mr. Adams is uh, facilitating on behalf of the city that, because there's some street work that's required, we'll make sure that uh, uh, when we see the presentation tonight, that that, that doesn't exi exist. The, this is kind of an interesting agreement, and uh, you know the CAO can clarify. It, it was sort of a, a bit of a side deal that was promoted by the, the business community, uh, uh, put out their own money to uh, request some improvements. So uh, it's not you have sort of a, to deal with the reality that they were. They are partners in this as opposed to that they're just asking to use uh, the city's right-of-way. 
So we, we would have to be respectful of the historical uh, uh, situation that has been there, uh, but notwithstanding, it's a very good point in regard to the, the new precinct uh, that they're gonna have around uh, Province House. The, the issue that I'm sure we're going to possibly see at that open house this evening is we, may wish to bring in as a part of the new zoning bylaw, or it could be the OP, provisions that that, that building, uh, the view planes and things like that, the access around the building uh, is such that it won't be compromised. It is likely the most prominent building, uh, at least from the tourist point of view, as to who goes into that building in any given year. So we clearly wouldn't want to create a problem, but uh, uh, we'll be able to see that if the mayor's <laughs> the mayor and I will uh, uh, you know, uh, see what they're offering, and uh, uh, and again, there's no urgency on this, but I just, I, I sometimes in our department, uh, if you don't uh, uh, raise things early, then yeah. we're we're up against a date, and then he's wanting to resign it, and then I'd have to run for an emergency direction from council. So we got a little bit of time on that. So we'll see what they offer this evening, but. Okay. Uh, for the most part, the agreement has worked relatively well between us and them. There has been some enforcement issues. Uh, we, they have been, they've, they've uh, dealt with it the very day that we went down uh, because, you know, we basically implied to the merchants that look, we don't want this to be a problem or council, not me, uh, you know, may think differently when it comes up for renewal if, if it's a problem. So uh, the, the problems in the past have been small and corrected in a timely manner. Thank you. Madam Chair, just, just to make sure that everyone knows that this plan was prepared for the Charlottetown Area Development Corporation. So Mr. Adams is at the meeting tonight, I believe, with Aaron Hansen. Correct. So Correct. Mr. Adams' role is more to talk about the infrastructure part of it. And uh, on, on, on the pedestrian mall agreement for Victoria Row, I know there are business interests on Sydney, Councillor uh, Councillor uh, Beck, Sydney Street, they'd love to do the same layout. We've gone through this, went over it, I think covered it over two years. This plan does incorporate that uh, Sydney Street uh, pedestrian mall uh, proposal or idea. But Madam Chair, I know at the last meeting you did ask about uh, the accessibility of outdoor patios. Is this part of the pedestrian mall agreement? Like, do, I know you asked about it, but um, is this the appropriate place or do we just leave this to the next meeting? I, I think that was something that was dealt and asked at the last meeting, do you recall? Uh, yeah, and, and I know that um, the accessibility piece I know is being, dealt with with the existing patios as well as those that were brought in for temporary with COVID. So I think there's 51 parking spots altogether, and those will be looked at by police and fire, that department under which looking at how many of those will then become permanent and ensuring that the accessibility piece and that lens has been applied to that. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. It does. I just thought it was uh, the pedestrian mall is an area. No, I know that. It's just that it's an area that has outdoor patios. We had the discussion because of the number of pat outdoor patios increased due to COVID-19. And I just didn't, again, let's stay out of the silos and try to work together with the different departments. It's actually a really good question because when we do look at that pedestrian mall, is it accessible to everybody when we have that small little area where people can walk, is it is it accessible? Is it, uh, is it yeah, wide the, enough? The, there's two issues down there. There's the sidewalk right in front of the businesses, and they don't want that blocked, and it's very clearly outlined in there. Uh, the other component of that uh, is that they keep wanting to creep out <laughs> into the into the street right away. The fire department has historically resisted that because they're, they need 20 feet to drop the big legs on the, on the uh, if they have to get in there with a bucket truck or whatever, uh, and an aerial truck. So they don't want that impeded. So uh, I think we did a little bit of a test one year to see that, I think went through council just to see what how that would be. There was just a table, uh, I think three or four uh, deuce tables, two people at the end of, uh, just on the sidewalk, but but the fire department is fairly adamant that they, unless something changed, changes in there, 
the other thing that could happen in there in the future is the concept of uh, like a roll curb. You have a defined curb in there, and that's where the fire department is holding firm on their 20 feet. But if, if, if you did a redesign in there, and uh, what happens, the uh, province house may roll over into this area for further improvements. And when you, uh, you may have a situation because it's so pedestrian friendly, uh, that's what they did in Halifax on those downtown pedestrian streets. There is no curb. So the, if that were to occur, the fire department would have their 20 feet, uh, that they wouldn't have to have you know, the legs up on a curb or whatever, it's all flat. Uh, so, uh, but we, we will revisit that as well. I mean, it may not be at the next council meeting, I'll discuss with my colleagues, but it's just a matter of, I just wanted you to be aware of, I need to update the agreement. If you had any concerns, let me know, and we will bring it back uh, to the council, uh, indicating for a five more year period, I will have some internal discussions with my colleagues to make sure that they're comfortable with the document that's in place. If we make changes, we'll let you know. Okay. So if there's nothing else, I will need a motion to move into closed, se closed session as per section 1191, subsection E, a matter under consideration. Moved by His Worship, seconded by Councillor Beck.
We don't have time. We've got to be down at the library. <laughs> Okay, everyone, we're back in open session, um, and um, I have a motion here um, that the Planning and Heritage Committee recommend to Council that the contract with Eagle View Pictometry Canada to provide orthophotography mapping for the City of Charlottetown be flown in 2023 and 2025 and pay $18,650.03 plus HST per year for this service over a four-year period between 2023 and 2026 be approved. Okay, moved by Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor Beck. Just Those to clarify. Right. Yes. So, Mr. Forbes, four years, eight, again, clarify, clarification for the record, 18,000 per year. Correct. Times four, 64. Right, yep. Okay. Two flies. Yep. Two, and it, so it, it, it's consistently updating our, uh, our data that we've been updating for every two years for pretty, I think, since I've arrived here. Yeah, so th th but again, th that's four times 16,000 per year. 18,000. 18,000 per right, year. Right, yep. Okay. And it's just, it, it's just embedding it in, in my budget so I don't have to come to you in a scramble on any given year to come up with a whole lot of money. It just balances out my budget because it's a tool the planning department uses on a daily basis. And it's a planning tool that's used in best practices anywhere there's a jurisdiction that has planning and development. Absolutely. Right on. <laughs> yep. So, all those, question, all those in favor? Okay. And we just have one more motion to adjourn. <laughs> Councillor McCabe, Councillor Beck. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank what you a very great, much. great.